Uh, so let's get started. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. If you're not familiar with the way the Bible is constructed, I will try to be mindful of, of helping to um, maybe connect some of the dots uh, for what that's like. But um, this document that we call 1 Corinthians is a letter, okay? Uh, it was a letter that was written by Paul, and it was written to a church, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but it's found in the New Testament, so um, if you are using a paper paper Bible, um, you can find it there, find it on your mobile device, but we'll also have the verses up here on the screen. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Paul, called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in him in every way, in all speech and all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want to read verse 1 again um, and make some introductions. Today uh, we'll largely be looking at some definitions, some ideas, some concepts that I think will help to set up the framework for our study of 1 Corinthians. So verse 1 says, Paul called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will and Sosthenes, our brother. You can see this is an introduction to the letter, right? Paul is referring to himself as the author uh, of this letter. And um, so what we find here is the letter was written by Paul. Uh, there is uh, some historical criticism that would suggest that uh, Paul did not write this letter, but uh, most scholars who are really honest uh, with uh, the facts that we have available to us would credit this letter as something that was written uh, authentically by uh, this guy that we often refer to as the Apostle Paul. Right, so Paul identifies himself as the author. Now Paul is responsible for writing a significant part of the New Testament of the Bible, right? The second division of our Bible. Uh, next to Luke, uh, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote the Book of Acts, right? Which chronicles the founding and the growth of the church immediately following Jesus' resurrection. And so by, uh, by word count, Luke wrote most of the New Testament. But Paul falls closely behind. And Paul has more uh, letters. In fact, everything that Paul writes comes in the form of a letter. It's either a letter to a church, like this letter was addressed to a church at Corinth, uh, or to an individual. Um, like when you read uh, the letter of Paul to Titus or the letters of Paul to Timothy, right? So Paul, Paul writes in these form of letters um, and um, they account for kind of the second largest portion of our New Testament. Now, Paul himself, uh, you can read his story or you can read his testimony in Acts chapter 9. Okay? Paul is a person that experienced a significant change of direction in his life. Uh, he was uh, a, an elite, uh, up-and-coming leader among the Jewish people. In fact, he was uh, making it his life's mission to stomp out any trace of this thing called the Christian church that had begun to rise in prominence. Uh, the Christian church was really um, a transition of largely Jewish people <coughs> who began understanding that Jesus Christ was in fact their promised Messiah. 
and now are beginning to profess their allegiance in him. And Paul saw that as a threat to the genuine Jewish faith. And so he was doing everything he could to stomp it out. And Acts chapter 9, you find the story of Paul's conversion. That Paul encountered a revelation of Jesus himself. Um, Paul gives a little of his testimony in regard to how he is now preaching the gospel, right? Paul talks often about the gospel. And he says in another letter that he wrote, Galatians, uh, in chapter 1, he says, the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it. But it came by revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul, as this authority figure in the ancient church, um, rather than having gone to school like I did, um, or that many who have worked on studying such things as the gospel and the Bible, Paul says, I received a revelation from Jesus Christ himself. Right? And again, that account is given to us in Acts chapter 9. He says the gospel that he preaches didn't come from another person's teaching. He's not simply rehashing something that he received from somebody else. But rather, he is giving us a direct revelation from Jesus himself. Paul identifies himself as one who was called to be an apostle. And so he uses uh, this designation of calling to describe something about himself. Perhaps you have heard or used this idea of calling for uh, yourself. But the fact that he was called tells us that he was called to become something that he wasn't before. Right? Like again, you'll find in that division of his life, you have, before he encountered Jesus, you have a life that was lived against Jesus, against the church. And he was called from that place to become an, a very apostle of Jesus Christ. So he was called to something that he was not before. He wasn't an apostle. He was a persecutor of the church. But he became an apostle by means of God's divine call. That is, he did not become an apostle because he sent in his resume, right? Like there was an op opening in the... Um, in the position of apostle of Jesus Christ. And so he, he's like, oh, that sounds like a cool job, pays really awesome. And, uh, and, and so he sends in his resume and, and then ha conducts a series of interviews. No, he, he was called by Jesus to this commission. When we talk about calling, calling implies being called out of something and to or for something. Uh, you might, in your workplace, you might be called out, especially from among uh, the other people that you're working with, to do something else, right? We might call that a promotion. Uh, based, on, based on the experience that you have accumulated over time, uh, the work and the contribution that you've put into your company, uh, there's some recognition of that and a movement towards something else. And so... Uh, while one day you're doing the work of other people that may be working in your department, uh, you may be called out of that to something else. Maybe you're called to lead that department. Maybe you're called to do something differently entirely, right? But calling implies being called out of something and to or for something. Paul was called out of the world that he was living in. And this is a very dramatic and transformative change in his life. Again, like, you, you, you almost couldn't be walking in a more different direction with your life than Paul was when he encountered Jesus and Jesus turned his life around and steered him in a completely different direction. And I think it paints a very important picture for us who are also finding ourselves being called out of something 
for the purpose of being called for or to something else, right? Paul was called out of this world in order to be sent back into the world, but not to be sent back into the world the same kind of guy that he was before he was called. No, he was radically changed. He was altogether different. The, the, the circumstances of his life may have largely stayed intact, but the trajectory of his life became altogether different. The priorities that he had, the way he woke up in the morning was radically different than it had been just days before. Right? Because that's what happens when a person encounters Jesus. When a person begins to understand what they are and how they are called. This is the beauty of understanding our story. Of, of thinking about the story of your life, my life, and how that story interacts with the other stories of those around us, as well as the grander story of God. What God has called us from, what we, because of that calling, then leave behind, and what we purpose to then live and do as a result of that, right? There's this understanding that when I am called, I am becoming something that I wasn't before. Now, we all who profess allegiance to Jesus as Lord and Savior, we who have experienced that revelation and that transformation of our heart and our life, the direction that we're going and the commitment that we're making to follow Jesus, we would be described as those who are called as well. That calling is not limited to a mere handful of people, like apostles. <laughs> you know, specially called and gifted individuals who are given a platform or who are given some prominent place of influence. No. The person, the man, the woman, the boy or the girl who professes faith in the work that Jesus has done in our lives is called. Have you ever thought of yourself as one who has been especially called by God? Have you ever thought about what God has or what God is calling you to? You know, a lot of times we think in terms of what we're doing. Um, you know, we think that, we think in terms of that our participation in a church like this is, it is, it's a result of some decision we've made, right? Like, we have all decided to come to this church today. Uh, maybe this has been your practice for a long time, but it largely results from a decision that you made. Uh, when we choose to be active or to engage in some particular thing, we often think about it in terms of how we're being generous um, with our time towards some invitation that is made. For instance, an invitation is made to serve in, you know, some particular capacity. And so we consider it and we think, you know, um, sure, I can, I can help out there. And we think in terms of kind of our good nature and our willingness to jump in and help where needed. Or an invitation is given to, um, for people to give to some particular effort. And we consider it and we think, you know, yeah, I can... I can participate in contributing to that thing. And so, um, again, as a gesture of our generosity, we, we give, we involve ourselves. But I wonder if we miss out on really understanding the framework of what it means to be called to something. That this Christian life that God wants me to 
participate in is not about me considering the various options that are out there and then deciding what it is that I'll do or not do or whatever, but instead it's more a discerning of what God is calling me into, what God is inviting me into. It's not just about filling up a slot because somebody got up here and said, hey, this, we got this going on, we need some help, who can help? But rather there's a, there's a, there's a, a broader and more holistic way of looking at my life as one who has surrendered to Jesus and has therefore been called. I've been called out of the world. I've been called out of my old life. I've been called out of the world's way of doing things, and I've been called to and for a particular purpose. We all have. And so I just wonder, am I truly seeking God's will for my life? Is there something about the nature of my relationship with God that has me seeking and desiring to determine what God really wants for me, what God has called me to? Where is my concern measured? When I think about my life, like, how do I measure what it is that either I'm doing, how I'm living? Am I measuring things according to my own happiness? Am I measuring things according to how others assess my life or how others may esteem me? Or do I measure according to how God evaluates the degree to which I've used what he has given me and blessed me with? In other words, here I am with this life and everything that comes along with it. Have I surrendered that to the will and the call of God? Am I concerned with the way or how God would evaluate my life as I'm living it? Or is that just so far off the radar that it matters not? Like, that I'm far more concerned with increasing my own personal happiness. Or I am more concerned with increasing my perceived esteem that I have among other people. The people that I work with. The people that I live near. Right? The people that I associate with. Are those the matter? Is, is that the way I measure the relative success of my life? Or am I willing to put myself up against the evaluation of God and God alone? So have you considered how God has called you? Now, Paul's calling was very specific, right? So he identifies himself here in verse 1 as an apostle. Now, what does this mean? Well, an apostle simply means someone who is sent. That's, the very, that's kind of the, the, the base idea of what an apostle is. An apostle is a person who is sent, like commissioned, you know, often with a message. Right? A person is given a message, they are sent to convey that message somewhere, and so boop, 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 off they go. Um, now, we understand that there is, with apostleship, there is also a kind of office that Jesus gave to the church as a means of providing um, a certain kind of leadership. And so we, we think of the, the, the disciples that most closely follow Jesus during his time here on earth, right? They, those disciples became apostles, right? They became those, right? Jesus, in his closing words to them, you know, he, he looks at them and he says, now I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? He commissioned them. He apostolized them. They became apostles. Now, Paul wasn't part of that original gang, but... Paul did have this very unique experience where he encountered, where he experienced the risen Christ, right? Again, back in Acts chapter 9. And so he became an apostle. Now, an apostle, in this sense, is one who is entrusted with significant authority. 
You think about the authority that Paul had as he was going from place to place and he was establishing churches from the ground up, or he was going to a church perhaps that had sort of been established and he was, um, he was being used in a capacity to exercise spiritual authority among that particular group of believers. Um, the apostle, their ministry was oftentimes accompanied by incredible signs and wonders. As you read through the narratives uh, of the book of Acts, you'll find people like Peter demonstrating the power of God through miraculous healings and miracles. Like things, the kinds of things that you read about Jesus doing in the Gospels, you find the apostles oftentimes involved in themselves. But you also find, like, in the life of an apostle, a life of incredible hardship, a life of incredible duress, a life of incredible persecution, and for most of them, even martyrdom. You know, it's interesting, today you have uh, people that want to, uh, to extend uh, their platform or raise their level of prominence. Uh, you have people that want to exercise a significant amount of spiritual authority among the church today. And they're so happy to have the esteem of others. They're so happy to have the praises of the multitudes. They're so happy to be famous and to be uh, uh, sought after to write the next great book, right? Or, or to have... Uh, uh, Many, many people engaging with them on social media or listening to their sermons. Right? They love all of this kind of praiseworthy part of what they might identify as a kind of apostleship. There are those that would claim to have uh, uh, significant power in working uh, miraculously and through healing ministries and things like that. And you know, every time I see or hear about one of these kinds of things rising up, I always wonder, is there a commensurate amount of hardship, of duress, of persecution that that person who so loves their platform and so loves the praises of others that they are going through? Because to me, it seems like the gift of apostleship is always accompanied by incredible, incredible persecution. And those that would work against you. Do you read Paul? I mean, yeah. Did he have the privilege of seeing like the most incredible things as an apostle of Jesus? Yeah, he did. But along with that, he lived the kind of life that few of us would ever sign up for. So Paul's an apostle. Now the Christian life, where you and I, we may not be called to the kind of ministry that Paul was called to. Uh, what we do need to understand is that the Christian life will be experienced more deeply when we're able to identify and live out our calling. Right? That you and I, we have the job of determining God's will for our lives and what God is calling us into. And I'm afraid that so many, they, they live a very, very shallow form of Christianity because they haven't done this. They're not doing this. They're so, uh, more happy to just simply be associated with a church. They're happy to attend when it's convenient. Rather than truly discerning what has God put me on this earth for? What has God made me a part of this church for? Why has God put me in this community? Why has God put me in this particular workplace? Like, what is it that God has called me into? If we're going to experience the depth of Christian life that I believe God has for us, we have to wrestle with what it is that we're being called to. You might wonder, uh, how do I know that I found it? Like, how do I know that I've found God's call? How do I know that I'm not just kind of you know, riding along this thing. We're not just simply you know, helping occasionally where uh, help is needed or giving occasionally when, you know, I feel a little bit of a, an emotional pull to give. I, how do I know that I'm actually pouring my life into 
the way in w- that God has called me. Well, I think some of the markers will be things like, you know, when you find your calling, it will often align with the very unique way that God has made you or that God has wired you. Like it's going to often fall in tandem with the way in which God has specially crafted you as an individual. We might say it like this, you know, there, there are things that only you can do. <laughs> right? The you that you are, like you're the only you that, that, that this world is going to get. And so God is, what he has called you specifically into, it, it, there's a tendency for it to align with the unique way in which God has called and wired you. Not only that, but when you begin pouring your life into what God has called you to, it is going to make you feel the emotional extremes that come along with that. Right? That there are going to be those times at which you will experience ecstatic, elation, jubilance. Right? Because as you're pouring your life out, you're just seeing this incredible work of God unfolding before you. But guess what? Not only will you experience that deep extreme, but you will experience also the deep extreme of sorrow and of mourning and of devastation. You know, um, if you've been around for a while, uh, maybe you notice that over the course of time, the the, the outdoor grounds here are getting, they're a lot nicer, right? The grass looks nicer. There's um, landscaping and things like that. There's, there's been outdoor maintenance that's taken place that uh, had for a long time been largely neglected. And um, you know why that's happening is because there's a person that feels called to do that. There are people that feel called to participate in that. And, and let me tell you something about them, right? Uh, they, they will... They will experience the joy of the beauty that's being created um, at times. And they will also be the ones that are most disturbed when things don't look right. Or that somebody has neglected uh, some particular area that's diminishing the beauty of a place. Right? Because, like, well, they're wired, they're wired for that thing. Um, if you... You know, a person that is called into doing ministry with children, they're going to experience like these, these moments of blessing when, uh, when, when, when they're talking to a kid and, and the kid gets it. And it's just like their hearts are, are, are just, they're warmed, right? And they're excited for the, 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 just the beauty of how God is transforming the life or the lives of young people. But they're also going to experience at times like the devastation and the sorrow that comes when a kid stops showing up and they don't know what's happened to him or her. Or when, uh, you know, this person that they've poured their lives into starts making choices that they know are unhealthy and are leading them away from all that God has for their lives, right? Because, like, this is what ministry looks like. I can tell you that I, um, I experience these, uh, these times. I, I, I want to quit all the time. I know you think this is fun. Right? And how lucky am I that I get to do this? And you're right. It's an incredible privilege. And there are times where I'm so thankful for what God does and what God is doing. There are times where I just, like, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. It, it's in those extremes that you actually find a deep sense of worth for what you're actually doing. And so if you don't, if you don't have that, I, w- I just want to encourage you to be seek- honestly seeking, God, what is it, what is your will for my life? What are you calling me into? God, I don't want to. I don't want to live this just kind of like skating by type of life. But I want to be one who is truly pouring myself into something that is meaningful and significant. So Paul's calling was 
specific. We need to better understand specifically what God has called us into. Now, um, verse 1 closes with um, this mention of Sosthenes, right? So Paul introduces himself as the author of the letter, and he says, with Sosthenes. Now, who's Sosthenes? Well, we don't know for sure. But there is something interesting. If you want to write down Acts chapter 18, Acts 18 actually introduces us to Paul visiting Corinth for the first time and starting up this ministry that will ultimately become a church that was so prominent that Paul wrote two letters, at least two letters to them, two letters that we have in the canon of Scripture. But Sosthenes, is, he's a man by the name of Sosthenes is referred to in Acts chapter 18. Could be the same guy, we don't know. Anyway, verse 2, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints with all those in every place who call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours. So this letter was addressed to a particular church. It was addressed to the church at Corinth. Okay? The, you ever wonder, like, how did we get the Bible? Like, what is this? It's important to understand that this is a real letter written by a real guy to a real group of people. And so like any ancient letter in the Bible, it needs to be read in its proper context. Here we're introduced to the, um, the word that we translate, oftentimes church, the word ekklesia. Right? He says to the ekklesia at Corinth. Ekklesia is um, an assembly. It's an assembly of people. It's, it's, a, it's a group of people that have been called out for an announcement or a gathering. And that's what they are. Uh, the church at Corinth is essentially, it's not about, you know, a, a, a building that's been erected. It's not about um, an organization, you know, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that has been created and uh, um, now sanctioned by the government. No, it's, it's simply, at its very, very purest and base form, it is, it's a gathering of people. People who are called out to assemble. So to speak of the church of God at Corinth, we might think of it as a church, like with a little C, right? Um, similar to how we might talk about the church that is at Curtis Lake, right? We're not the church, like we don't, we don't represent the entirety of this thing called the church. We are, we're a church, uh, as opposed to the big C church, which we'll look at in just a second. So the letters address this particular church, and this church is comprised of what Paul describes as those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Right? So he uses this fancy word, sanctified, which simply means that they were set apart for a sacred purpose. I don't know if you've caught on, but there's a lot kind of being poured into this idea of being called out for a purpose, set aside for a purpose. That's exactly what sanctified means. To sanctify something means to take something that might otherwise be ordinary. You know, like in, uh, and during the days of uh, temple worship, there may, be, there may have been some particular vessel that was used in some religious rite, right? And it was, until it was sanctified, it was just simply a vessel. But then once it was sanctified, once it was separated from all of the other vessels and determined to be holy, determined to be uh, to, to be specially used for a particular purpose, now all of a sudden it had a different kind of significance. And the same picture is used to draw on the life of the Christian. That is that we were at one time ordinary people. But we have been sanctified, we've been called out, and for a purpose. Um, he describes them as saints. Saints. Did you know that if you are a follower of Jesus, you're a saint? You don't need a church to ratify your sainthood, right? This is why we don't practice things like sainthood or canonizing people like you might find in, in something like the Catholic Church, right? Because the Bible declares we are all saints. That there's, while there may be a difference in the offices and capacities that we might form or fulfill in a church... There's no difference between clergy and laity. There's no difference between the preacher, right, or the pastor, or a teacher, and anybody else. 
that might just be considered a lay person. Right? There's no distinction. The church is the sum of all those in every place who call on Jesus Christ. Right? This is Paul. He uh, refers to this little C church as the church at Corinth, but then also kind of brings them in and piles them together with the big C church. Now, what is the church? Well, the church is it's the sum of all those in every place, and we might add now, for all time, <laughs> who call on Jesus Christ. This is very important. The church is comprised very specifically of certain individuals. Now, who are those individuals? Right? Because you will have, at any particular gathering, right, this is a public worship service. This is open to everybody. Anybody can come and worship with us on a Sunday morning, right? And nobody's credentials get checked, I don't think, right? Right? Did anybody have to, did you, did you have to, like, show your badge or sign a piece of paper saying, I'm a committed, devoted follower of Jesus in order to come in here? No, right? So this is a public worship service that's open to anybody and everybody. And so what you would expect in a worship service like this is that there are going to be those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus, and there will be those who have not, right? There's a mix, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully it's not just the choir that's here every Sunday morning, right? Hopefully among the church there are those who are lost and without Christ, who need to hear the gospel, who need to be called and transformed. So the church is the sum of all those in every place for all time who call on Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it means very specifically that the church is comprised of those who have declared and are living out their allegiance to Jesus as Lord. Paul refers to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now remember, whenever you see Jesus Christ, we're not talking about first and last name. When you see Christ Jesus, in any of Paul's writings, what Paul is doing is Paul is saying something to the effect of King Jesus. Like Christ is a, it is a title of messiahship. It is a title of regal authority. It is this declaration on the part of the person who is uttering it that Jesus is king. He's King Jesus. So what does it, what does it require for us to be a part of the church? Well, it requires a willingness to surrender to Jesus as king. To declare our allegiance, our loyalty, and our obedience to him as our king. Now very quickly, um, as we wrap up, Paul, he goes into this after kind of introducing uh, some very, very important facts and features about the church in this letter. He he utter some words of thanksgiving. Uh, I always thank my God for you, he says, right? So as he's thinking about this church, as he's reflecting on the relationship that he has had with them for some time, we don't know exactly how long, between, um, you know, that first day he landed in Corinth and started having conversations with people and this little fledgling church started to uh, arise uh, up until this point, but clearly some time has, um, has gone by. And so now as he's thinking about this church, he says, I always thank God for you because of the grace God has given to you in Christ Jesus, that you are enriched in him in every way, in all speech and all knowledge. Now, we call this my messy church because one of the things that this letter of 1 Corinthians reveals to us is that the church in Corinth was a mess. <laughs> they were a mess. They were a disaster. They had, they had incredible things going on. And here... I, you know, uh, we can see just a hint of while Paul is very thankful for what God has done in the church, there's, as a result of all the incredible things that had happened in, and that were, were happening in the church, the church became proud. And this is a problem for any church that's experiencing relative success. It seems to be on this trajectory of just of growth and growing influence, right? Of other people like, wow, that is such a, what a 
what a church that, that must be, right? I, I can't tell you the, uh, the number of pastors and, and church people that, you know, wish we could just kind of be like this other church, right, that's doing things so much better than, than we are, right? And like they figured it out. They've got the magic sauce, and if we could just, if we could get the magic sauce, then we could be awesome like they are. But what happens so often times in these churches is they become full of pride. And, and it creates certain problems. And so the problems, some of the problems we're going to look at, the problems of division, right? They had this incredible problem of division. The problems of immorality, um, that they, they, they were so proud that they were okay with just allowing and sustaining incredible instances of immorality to exist among their church. Uh, the problem of idolatry, the problem of worship gatherings that were just out of control and were being used to, um, to benefit, you know, those who had the loudest voices or appeared to be the most gifted among the others. And they had the problem of corrupted belief. So while they were a highly privileged church, that privilege also created incredible problems for pride. So Paul goes on with this thanksgiving. He says, in this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what the church of Corinth was full of? It was full of gifted individuals. It was full of people that had all kinds of incredible gifts, all kinds of ways that they were able to kind of bring to the table just this wonderful, wonderful, you know, way in which God was using them. But problems arose because those gifts began to be used for one's own use and to fulfill one's own selfish desires. Problems arose because the gifts were not instructed by the law of love or motivated by the law of love. And because uh, while they were very, very exercised in Using all of their gifts, those gifts were not used in the context of love, and so they became like nothing. And then Paul closes the section with, he will strengthen, that is, Jesus will strengthen you to the end, so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, when I read that, I can't help but think, Paul has this understanding that while this church might have been a mess, the church was a work in progress. Paul understood that people aren't perfect, and neither was the church, but the church was a work in progress. And so my prayer for us is we go through this together over these next weeks, we'll find what it is that God is calling us individually to. How God is moving in our hearts and lives. How God wants to take the hot mess that you might feel like your life is and turn it into something that is meaningful and substantial. How God wants to take the hot mess of like what our church is, because how many of you know this church isn't perfect? <laughs> right, it's not. Never will be. But we're a work in progress. And my hope, my prayer, is that we will surrender ourselves to the what God wants to do, what God wants to work in each of us, and how he wants to do that in us together.